Okay. <clears throat> Can you guys hear? Okay. All right. Well, this is the only time I was able to live stream. My brother and his spouse left 20 minutes ago, so I should have about an hour and a half until I find my own place. Pray that the Lord Jesus grants me favor November 20th <clears throat> and pray that by December, near the end of December, I'm in my own place with internet connection because my other brother is going to be joining me. We're going to be living here. But most importantly of all, pray in Jesus' name. I get my daughters again to hold them, love them, put them sleep, and I can start a local Bible study, right? So welcome, everyone. <clears throat> I praise the Lord Jesus Christ that we're able to gather and speak freely and speak the truth of God's word by the power of the Holy Spirit, because I expect the day will come. We're going to be in jail for speaking the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, when that day comes, I pray he gives us such boldness and power to gl gladly go to jail for that reason. In Jesus' name, I go to jail glorifying Jesus Christ, taking a stand for his word, but not for something else in Jesus' name. So good to see you guys. I'll begin in prayer in a minute. Pray that we get the regulars to uh, show up. And just for the record, if you guys want to know what shirt I'm wearing, here, let me show you something. Wow. Look at that. Let's see. Let's see. Let me just show you one more. Wow. All right. Okay. Anyway, pray for me. To lose another 50 pounds, keep it off, get healthier, but more importantly, to be holier, sold out for Jesus, for the glory of Christ, and pray for more wisdom, knowledge, understanding. As you guys can tell, one of the biggest influences in my life was Bruce Lee, but glory to Jesus Christ that I'm a believer, sealed by the Spirit, born of the Spirit, so I can separate the wheat from the chaff from his teachings. He even has influenced my apologetic style. One thing I learned from his fighting philosophy is that there are no passive blocks in a system. He doesn't block and hit like traditional karate does. His block is a hit, what he called the intercepting fist or the stopping fist. So he would block you by hitting you, right? <clears throat> so that's how I've modeled my apologetics by the grace of God's spirit. What do I mean? When I'm refuting the Muslim... <clears throat> I'm not just refuting, I'm also decimating and destroying, obliterating his objection. You've heard me say in the past, turn the objection against them. As you're answering the objection, turn that same objection against them to decimate and destroy their religion. Believe it or not, believe it or not, that's because I've been influenced by Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do, the way of the stopping fist, right? Who would have thunk it? So by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, by his mercy, I separate the wheat from the chaff, even from Bruce Lee's teaching, and use it in my apologetics. Ah, so, huh, you little racist, white, Caucasian hater. Anyway, good to see you guys. Let's first ask the Lord to bless. One day I'm going to see a thousand, man. If David Wood, as boring as he is, and Christian Prince, as mean as he is, can get a thousand, then by golly, I can too, right? But we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, we praise you for who you are. We praise you for your son, the Lord Jesus, and the gift of your son that you've given us. We praise you for your Holy Spirit and fill us, filling us with your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ, Father, and please forgive us for our shortcomings and our failures today. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit to die to our flesh, to conquer our flesh, to crucify our flesh, and remove the stain and the fruit of our flesh. Fill us with fruit from your Spirit, Father, life and power from your Spirit, faithfulness, holiness and love and devotion and purity from your spirit and wisdom and knowledge understanding from your spirit father bless this session abba <clears throat> because of the lord jesus and because of the, the grace of your spirit causing us to be born again and uniting us to christ we can call you abba we can call you baba babi our father the father of our lord and savior jesus christ for the sake of your son anoint the words of my mouth to speak clearly without error confusion stammering or stuttering father 
enable me to recall the scriptures perfectly and inter interpret them correctly by the power of the Holy Spirit and purify our motives. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus to do it to glorify Jesus, not for the praise of men. And save me from being unnecessarily offensive, Father. Fill us with wisdom and knowledge and faith and love and devotion from your Holy Spirit. Seal us by your Spirit. Bless our loved ones. Seal our loved ones, my daughters, by your Spirit. Cover them with the blood of Jesus. Seal them, Father, for your glory. And please provide th through me for them. And Father, please bless this time. Have your way. Protect us from attacks of Satan. Bless the internet connection for your glory, Father. For the glory of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, please show up. I beg you, show up in a miraculous way November 20th. Keep me planted here and bring my daughters to me. Thank you, Father, for putting love in the hearts of those who come to listen to me. They're not here for me. They're here because they trust Jesus Christ will anoint me by the Spirit to unpack the Word so we can fall more passionately in love with Jesus because we cannot love him enough. We love you, Baba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Ya Allah, Father, Son, Spirit. All right. Okay, now <clears throat> I'm actually torn because I was asked. I was asked to discuss some of the evidences I would use from the Quran to prove that though the Quran paints a contradictory portrait of Jesus, a contradictory picture of Jesus, the Quran does say things about Jesus that prove that Jesus is no mere creature, that he has to be God in the flesh. Because Muhammad, in his ignorance, though inspired by Satan, I believe that, was aping certain <clears throat> beliefs of the Christians with the hopes that he could connive and deceive Christians into thinking he was a true prophet. But the things that he adopted from their beliefs end up exposing him as a fraud and antichrist. Right? So... <clears throat> I can either, what's up, Lisa? How are you, sister? I can either discuss that or, because you, you understand what my passion has been, <clears throat> to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to know my Bible, and to be given power from the Holy Spirit, to live out my Bible for the glory of Jesus so I can know my God and fall in love with my God and honor my God, and then to teach others to know the Bible, right? Yeah. Well, you're going to get a lot of death threats, Rob Christian. So either you can let Satan scare you and intimidate you and paralyze you with fear, or you can trust Jesus Christ, be wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. Don't be foolish. But at the same time, do not let the threats overwhelm you because that is a satanic deception. You're not the only one being threatened. We've all been threatened. And yet, as you can tell, not because we're tough guys, but we know the Holy Spirit of the living God is our shield, and we're only going to die when Jesus wants us to die. We still walk in the midst of Muslims. We go to Muslim territories because you cannot let that scare you. If it's, you're going to let that scare you, Rob Christian, then you're in the wrong field, brother, right? So don't be afraid of their threats. Not saying be stupid. Be wise. Do all you can to make sure you're safe, but not at the expense where you become handicapped and paralyzed by fear because that's what Satan wants to do, right? Let me tell you something. That will put us off to shame, okay? Hatun Tash, you know that your sister in the Lord, Hatun Tash? Not only does she show her face publicly, she's out there in speaker's corner. And did you know she's been beat, beaten up more than five times? She's actually been physically beaten up. One time she was beaten up so bad, she had to wear a neck brace. And she's still there preaching the gospel, and she's not afraid. Now, if that woman has been beaten up physically by men, yes, I'm not lying. I'm not lying. She's been beaten up. She's gone to the hospital. Yes. Okay. If that woman has been beaten up by men and still goes out there, shame on you men for being afraid. You're a bunch of cowards. Okay. Just letting you know that. So don't come. You know, I'm not putting you down, Rob. But don't be, come here and say, oh, man, I'm being threatened. Hey, Amen. Part of the territory, dude. We all get threatened. Jesus is your shield by the Holy Spirit. He's our shield. But if you ever use threats as a way to appeal to sympathy, I'm not saying you are, or <clears throat> allow those threats to intimidate you, then Hatun is more of a man than you. Even though she's not a man, she's a warrior. She's a female warrior of Christ. Okay? She's been beaten up. One point she got beat up so badly she had a neck brace. And you saw David Wood's video, right? Okay. 
a Muslim threatened David Wood and told him that if he sees him, he'll kill him. So David Wood says, okay, meet me at this place at this hour. And the guy said, I'll be there. David Wood recorded. He went there and was waiting. The guy never showed up, calling his bluff, showing them, I'm not afraid. I'm willing to die for Jesus. No, they didn't get arrested, Irene. That's your liberal <clears throat> Europe for you. It's gone to the dogs. Now, Cass, please do me a favor. My brother, I think you're my brother in Christ. Please watch your language. Please don't use that language, graphic language, especially in front of sisters. Please. Cass, I've seen you here, and I'm assuming you're a Christian, right? There's no ha-ha about it. You're a Christian, right? Try to watch your mouth. Don't just use foul language for the heck of it. Right? Okay. So now I can do one of two things. I can show you how you can use the Quran against the Muslims to prove the Trinity and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or I feel impressed, meaning I have an impression, which I believe, again, it's from the Spirit. If it is, they'll confirm it. If not, the Lord protect me from attributing something to the Spirit that's not from the Spirit. Okay. I do feel a burden to talk about justification in the book of Romans. The reason why is because I'm more passionate about teaching Christians what the Bible teaches than about what Islam teaches. But we need to discuss Islam as well because that is one of the biggest challenges to the Christian faith, socially, politically, economically, spiritually. And we need to address Islam and destroy Islam by the power of the triune God so Muslims get saved and fall in love with Jesus. So we can talk about Islam or if you want me to talk about justification in the book of Romans, then I'm going to have to retitle this a little later. Okay. How many of you want to talk about justification in the book of Romans? Put one. One for Romans. Okay. Okay. The majority rules. It's Romans. All right. I'm going to have to retitle this. Okay. We're going to talk about it. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. One day, one day we will get to the Quran's war on Tawheed. I promise you. But let's talk about Romans, okay? Now, let me make some qualifications before I proceed. I affirm sola fide and sola scriptura. These are uniquely Protestant beliefs. Let me explain what sola scriptura and sola script, uh, fide means. Sola scriptura means that the Holy Bible is the sole, pay attention, the only infallible rule of faith. There are other authorities and rules that are not infallible, but can be mistaken, can be fallible, can contain errors. The only rule of authority that is infallible, completely reliable and trustworthy, is the scriptures, because the scriptures are the voice of God, and God cannot make mistakes. So, Sola Scriptura teaches, of all the authorities that exist in creation, of all the authorities in the world, there's only one authority that is free of all error, completely reliable, completely perfect, the scriptures. Right? And because the scriptures are the voice of God, Every other authority is subject to the Bible. Every other authority is beneath the Bible. There is no authority equal to the Bible, let alone greater than it, because you can't have an authority equal to the voice of God, let alone greater than the voice of God. That's sola scriptura, and I believe that. I believe the Bible teaches it. Roman Catholics, Orthodox historians don't believe that. Okay. Now, the second thing I believe, second thing. So I'm going to tell you where I'm coming from. And I have yet to be persuaded that these two doctrines of the Protestant <clears throat> denomination, I'm trying to find the appropriate word, are an error biblically. I've read, I've viewed objections to Sola Scriptura and Sola Fide from Roman Catholics, Orthodox, and I'm not convinced. Now you'll say, well, because you're biased, and so no, no matter how much evidence is presented, you'll explain it away, possibly. Remember, I am imperfect, and my knowledge of scriptures is imperfect. And obviously, if I'm teaching something, I believe that what I'm teaching is right, 
but I can be mistaken. And my wholehearted prayer is, Holy Spirit, you are my God, our God, our Lord, our love, our life, our provider, sustainer, savior, redeemer, regenerator, sanctifier, and teacher. So I trust in you, Holy Spirit. Show me where I'm wrong. Give me the grace to change my mistaken views and then the power to live your truth perfectly for the glory of Christ. That is my prayer for myself, and I pray that for all of you. So until the Holy Spirit shows me I'm in error, I believe in something called sola fide. What is sola fide? That the Bible teaches God justifies you, declares you righteous because of what Jesus did on your behalf, and you receive what Jesus did by faith in him apart from any works you do. That's sola fide. Let me define it again. So I'm coming from this perspective. Now, if you want to hear other perspectives, thank God for modern technology. Thank God for YouTube and the Internet. Type in Roman Catholics justification, Orthodox justification, Coptics justification. Get to hear the other side and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth and save you from error. Right. I've heard the best of the Roman Catholic apologists, Robert Sungenis, Scott. I've heard it. And I'm still persuaded the Bible teaches sola fide. So let me explain what sola fide is. Sola fide is the teaching that God declares you righteous, acquits you of your sins, pronounces the verdict innocent, not guilty of the charges, pronounces the verdict that you are righteous before him because of what Jesus did on your behalf. And what Jesus did on your behalf, you receive as a gift by faith in him apart from works. That's sola fide. You with me there? That's sola fide. Okay, so did you hear the definition of sola fide? We're justified by faith in Christ alone apart from any works we do. And our justification is granted to us as a gift, a free gift, which we receive by faith because that justification has been earned by the merits of Christ. Christ earned by his perfect life of obedience to the Father's will. <clears throat> Obedience to the point of dying and a cursed death, that perfect life of obedience is what earned this righteous standing that we enjoy before God as a gift by faith in Christ. You understand what sola fide means? Before I move on to why I believe the Bible teaches it, do you understand the definition? Do you understand the definition? If you understand what sola fide means, then I can show you from the book of Romans why I believe this is what the Bible teaches. If you understand the definition. Again, there are Catholics here and Orthodox disagree with me. Listen to what I'm about to say. We can agree to disagree. Just don't condemn me. Don't argue with me. Don't debate me. Hear me out. Hear why I believe it. Take the passages. Pray to the Holy Spirit to show you if I'm wrong, if I'm right, and hear the other side. Okay? So please, don't debate me. Right? Don't debate me. Meaning, I'm not saying believe it because I say it. Hear me out why I believe it. Beseech the Holy Spirit, who is our God and our teacher, and who will protect us and guide us into all truth. Holy Spirit, show me where he's wrong, or confirm to me, or can convict me that he's right. And then hear the other side, okay? Did you know, side note, and I'll do a discussion on this, side note. Did you know that Islam teaches sola fide? Did you know Islam teaches sola gratia? That you're saved by grace and mercy and that Allah saves you by faith alone? Did you know that Islam teaches this in its official authentic sources? may shock some of you. And you know, you even have Muslim scholars admitting this. A Muslim scholar named Hamza Yusuf do a search on YouTube. And one of the sessions, he was, he was invited to give a session. He admit Sunni Islam is closer to the Protestant 
belief of sola fide. He admitted it because there are statements in the Hadiths and in the Quran where you have Muhammad affirming, uh, for example, in Bukhari, there's a tradition. In Bukhari, there's a tradition where Muhammad says, not one of you shall enter paradise by your righteous deeds. And I'll do a session on this, God willing, in the future. He said, not one of you shall enter paradise by your righteous deeds. And they said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah. He goes, not even I, had it not been for the mercy of Allah. Serrated Spork, then you really don't know Islam. Islam has a sacrifice, though it's not perfect. Yep. Hamza Yusuf is the one who said, Daif means it passed. Daif a hadith. Serrated Spork. Islam does have a sacrifice, though it's not perfect. According to Sahih Muslim, Numbers 66, 65 to 66, 68, it says Allah will sacrifice Jews and Christians in hell as a ransom for the sins of Muslims. Okay? Sahih Muslim. English translation, the numbering for the English translation. Number 6665 to 6668. God willing, I'll do a session on that this week. If you want me to do a session on Islam and sola gratia, sola fide, I'll do that. But let me just give you one verse from the Quran where it says, you are saved by the mercy and grace of Allah. Just one verse from the Quran, and then we go into Romans. Are you ready? Are you excited? Are you in the saddle? Are you praying that we'll be filled with the Spirit? No, no, Ian Nizaw. The Muslim who tells you that is ignorant because the, the Quran says no bearer of burden can bear the burdens of another. It says no sinner can bear the sins of another, which is contradicted by Sahih Muslim. But the Quran leaves open the possibility that someone sinless can bear your burdens. Let me correct that again. There's not a single statement in the Quran that says someone who is sinless, who has no burdens to bear, is not able to bear your burdens. What the Quran says is someone who's burdened with sin cannot bear your sins, which is actually what we believe. But the Quran acknowledges Jesus is sinless. Okay. Chapter 24, verse 21 of the Quran. Say Christian, because again, you're pontificating. You think you're smart because you listen to CP. Let me just knock you off your camel. Are you aware that there are Christians like Calvinists who say that it's predestination in the Bible as well? So get off your horse, buddy, because I know you think you're riding high with CP. <laughs> oh, whoa there, Nelly. <laughs> All right. Chapter 24, verse 21. Oh, you who have believed. Here's the Quran. Chapter 24, verse 21. Oh, you who have believed. Do not follow. Do not follow the footsteps of Satan. Whoever follows the footsteps of Satan, indeed, he enjoins immorality. Now notice the second part. He enjoins immorality and wrongdoing. And if it not for the favor of Allah upon you, had it not been for the favor of Allah upon you and his mercy, not one of you would have been pure ever. But Allah purifies whom he wills and Allah is hearing and knowing. Did you catch it? Did you see what 2421 said? Had it not been for the favor and mercy of Allah on you, not one of you would be purified ever. So Allah purifies whom he wants. It's right there, 2421. Reread it. It's right there. And that's why Sai Krishna was saying it's predestination. Because the passage concludes by saying Allah purifies whom he wants. So if Allah has chosen beforehand to purify Andrew Martin, then Andrew Martin will be Andrew Martin will be purified, and then Allah will guide him into the truth. And then bring him into paradise. That's the implication of 2421. With that said, let's go to the book of Romans. Are we ready for the book of Romans? Because I don't have too much time. They're going to be coming back. No, Ron here. Islam is not a faith and works salvation system. In that, though the Quran says, Ron here, pay attention. Though the Quran says that Allah will judge your deeds on the scales, on the balance. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, 
and you have correct faith, Allah will bring you into paradise. However, Ron Hare, those statements have to be interpreted in the light of what the Quran teaches as a whole and in light of the statements attributed to Muhammad in the Hadith. What that really means, this is what it means. If Allah has chosen beforehand to save you, Ron Hare, out of his mercy and grace, then what will happen is, he will put you in a situation where you end up becoming a Muslim and then move you to do the good deeds that he will then put on a balance and then reward you with eternal life. But if Allah has chosen hell for you, then he's going to put you in a situation where you'll never be a Muslim or you'll turn away from Islam, right? You'll never be a Muslim or turn away from Islam and do the evil that will damn you to hell. You get that? You get my point? In other words, Islam is hyper-Calvinism before Calvinism. You get it? Hyper-Calvinism before Calvinism. Well, think about what I said around here. You answer the question. You're asking or stating? If I just said, if Allah has already chosen beforehand, to grace you and mercy you with Jannah, paradise, then he's going to put you in a situation where you end up becoming Muslim and doing the good, deed, good deeds that will earn paradise. But if Allah shows him beforehand to create you for hell, then he's going to put you in a situation where you either walk away from Islam or never embrace Islam and do the evil that will damn you to hell. What does that sound like? Okay. Now let's put Islam aside, God willing, Lord Jesus willing, the true God willing, the triune God willing, I'll do a talk on salvation in Islam. Okay? Salvation in Islam. Hyper-Calvinism before Calvinism. Because even among Calvinists, you don't have Calvinists who are double predestinarians. It gets complex. So there are various flavors of Calvinism. You can't group them all together. Right now, with that said, let me repeat because we're going to have people who are here that are Roman Catholics and Orthodox who are going to disagree with me. Okay, listen carefully. Listen carefully. I'm going to present the biblical basis that I believe confirms sola fide. Listen, because we're not here to debate. I'm going to present the biblical basis that leads me to believe. That the Protestant principle, sola fide, that God justifies people on the basis of the merits of Christ, which you receive as a free gift by faith in Christ alone apart from works, happens to be what the Bible teaches. Orthodox, Catholics, Coptics disagree. Fine. I don't want you to believe what I believe. Hear me out. Write down the passages or go back and listen to the live cast. Pray that the Holy Spirit will show you where I'm mistaken or confirm to you that I'm right. And go listen to other perspectives and then come to your own conclusion. But let me make the case why I believe it right now without you guys attacking me. Can we can we agree to at least listen? Because I do it. I listen to Roman Catholics, Orthodox, even live stream. I don't chime in. I hear what they got to say, take it into consideration, and come to my own conclusion. Okay. Let's start with a passage that's often misapplied, misinterpreted to teach that Paul taught that a person is justified by faith and works. Romans 2, 7 to 13. The reason why I want to start with this is because it's going to teach you how to interpret Scripture, how not to interpret Scripture. This will be a lesson in what we call the science of biblical interpretation, hermeneutics, right? Romans 2 7 to 13. Pay attention. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Pay attention. Guys, you got to read carefully here. To them, Paul is talking about those who by patient continuance, endurance, and doing good and well-doing, who patiently endure in doing good, Right? Seek for glory and honor, immortality, eternal life. So notice what Paul says. If you endure in doing good works, 
then you'll be given glory, honor, immortality, right? Eternal life. That will be the result of your efforts. But unto them that are contentious, cr create division. And do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath for them. Now notice, nine, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good. See, Paul seems to teach. You do good, do good as a believer, by the grace of God, you'll be given. What, what will you be given? Glory, honor, peace to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Now let's read 11 and 13. Pay attention. 11 and 13. For there is no respect of persons with, with God. God doesn't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile. What he cares is that you earnestly seek him and obey him. Okay. Now, 12. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Notice 13. This is what's cited to try to prove that Paul taught you're justified by faith and works, not faith alone. For not the hearers of the law are just before God. But the doers of the law shall be justified. Now, I got to go into meat. Notice what he says in 12. See, this is why even Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 15, 16, Paul writes some things that are difficult to understand. Not everything is difficult. Certain things, he says, can be baffling, which those who are untaught and unstable distort to their destruction like they do the other scriptures. Right? So you got to really prayerfully ask the Spirit to guide you to understand the wisdom that he gave Paul. Okay, now notice what he says in 12. As many have sinned without the law shall perish without the law. What is he talking about? And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. What do you mean, Paul, that those who have sinned without the law will perish without the law? And those who have sinned in the law, right, will be judged by the law. This is what he's talking about. Are you ready for me to unpack what he's saying? He's saying that the Jews were given God's law miraculously. God revealed the law miraculously when he appeared to the nation at the time of the Exodus. Appeared in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They saw the cloud. They heard the voice speak from the cloud. And they saw Moses enter the cloud and come out with the law. Right? So, are you with me what he's saying here? You understand the context before I move on? You understand the context? Okay. God only did this for the nation of Israel. He never revealed the law in this miraculous fashion to any other nation except the nation of Israel. Psalm 147, 19 and 20. Psalm 147, 19 to 20. Now, let me explain because there's a lot of meat. You wanted me to do Romans. It may not be as exciting, but it's going to be educational and ch challenging. Okay? Psalm 147, 19 to 20. As the Holy Spirit enables me to call the passages for the glory of Christ. He showed his word unto Jacob and his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. That's the law. He hath not dealt with so with any nation. As for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye, Job. You see what it's saying? This miraculous revealing of his statutes and his word was something God did only for the sons of Jacob. He didn't do this for any other nation. Did you catch it? Did you, ca you catch it? Okay, are you getting his point? Paul is saying the Jews were given the law in a miraculous fashion, unlike the other nations. So what does he mean when he says those who sin apart from the law will perish apart from the law? He means this way. The law has been given to mankind in one of two ways. To the nation of Israel, it was given miraculously. To the rest of us, it's been embedded in our hearts, in our conscience, so that the moral code has been embedded in our hearts, we who have been created in the image of God. As God's image bearers, God's law is written in our hearts. Even though sin has tainted that image, it hasn't effaced it, which is why even people, <clears throat> apart from the nation of Israel, 
know enough that adultery is wrong, murder is wrong, bearing false witness is wrong, cheating your neighbor is wrong. They know this even though God's law wasn't revealed miraculously to them as it was revealed to Israel. That's his point. And he confirms that in Romans 2, 14 and 15. Exactly, Pedro Jr. That's Romans 2, 14 and 15. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Okay. That's the conscience. Not one. I don't know, Protestant, why you think two is one. I wish you were here so I can sidekick you in the in the jaw and then repent later. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. See how much I love this guy? For when the Gentiles, see now he explains what he means. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature, do instinctively, naturally, the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves. You see what he just said? When the Gentiles who have not who have not received the law miraculously like Israel do the things that are contained in the law, they bear witness that the law is written in them because they know it instinctively. You see what he just said? And so 15, they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the means while accusing or else excusing one another. You see what he says here? Nations apart from Israel, without receiving the law miraculously, know instinctively sleeping with animals is bad. Committing adultery is bad. Murdering the innocent is bad. Cheating your neighbor and your loyal friend is bad. They know this instinctively, though they may go against it. And so on the day of judgment, Paul is saying, he will bring these nations before him and say, did you remember that day when you slept with your neighbor's wife and you were feeling guilty inside? That was my spirit convicting you, testifying that's wrong because I've embedded the moral law, the moral compass in your heart as part of the image in which you were created in, my image. You see what he's trying to say here? Then I want you to write down Romans 1, 18 to 32. We're not going to read it. It's too long. Ro write Romans 1, 18 to 32. Because then Paul argues that everyone under the sun knows God exists because of what's called general revelation. There are two kinds of revelations in Scripture. General revelation, right, and special revelation. General revelation is the revelation of God that everyone has access to. And that's what we call the revelation of creation. What do I mean by that? When you look to the sky and you see the sun and the moon and the stars, and you see the variety of trees and fruits and veg vegetables and plants and the variety of animals and birds and insects, instinctively and immediately you say, where did this all come from? In other words, you're not born an atheist. You have to be trained to be an atheist to suppress what is even common knowledge, even to a child. When I see trees and I see plants and I see insects and I see animals and I see stars and I see beauty and I see design and I see intricate details all around me, I don't need to be told that someone must have designed this. It's like me walking into a furnished room, and this is now a message to Andrew Martin, who suppresses this, though he knows better. I walk into a furnished room, and the last thing I say when I walk into a furnished house, wow, look at what natural selection and chance processes created. When I see a home, I know someone designed it. When I see a car, I know someone designed it. When I see a television set, I, I may not know who designed it, but the last thing I think, <whistles> billions of years of unaided processes brought this together. Wow. Right? 
Now, if that's true of something like a house, you're telling me now with all these scientific discoveries, billions of galaxies, right? Universes with billions of galaxies, with billions of stars. That's because about 20 billion years ago, what, 15.2 billion years ago, whatever the date is, something exploded. And as it exploded, as time went on, without an intelligent mind guiding these processes, this explosion produced these billions of universes with billions of galaxies, with billions of stars, so that through all this unaided processes, the earth came into being, which as far as we know, is the only life-permitting planet as far as we know. Yeah, I'm convinced there's no God. So that's what Romans 1, 18 to 32 is saying. Romans 1, 18 to 32 is saying. What is it saying? That they know God exists, and that's why his wrath is being revealed against them, because it's, they, it's not they don't know God exists. They know, but they suppress what they know instinctively because they want to defy God or they're angry with God and want to live contrary to his will. You with me there? Because Romans 1, 18 and 32 is too long, I'm going to go to a short, shorter chapter that talks about general revelation. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6. To the chief musician, a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. Pay attention. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. The complexity, the intricate design and beauty show the handiwork of God, right? The laws, okay, I'm reading King of Kings here. Day unto day utter speech. Every day creation utter speech. Now notice, notice the language of the psalmist. Night unto night showeth knowledge. Day in, day out. Night in, night out, night out. The creation brings forth knowledge, reveals there's a creator. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. In other words, creation is a universal language. People who speak Swahili, Punjabi, Gujarati, Urdu, <clears throat> Farsi, Telug, you name it, creation speaks their language. It's universal, right? There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and is circuit unto the ends of, of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. This is what we call general re revelation. So what is Paul arguing from? Every human creature under the sun knows God exists. Because creation testifies to the creator. That's number one. Number two, because human beings are image bearers of God, God's moral compass has been embedded in their hearts because they bear the image of God. Though tainted by sin, it's not been effaced. So what Paul is saying is God is going to judge every creature on the basis of those two things. Humans who have not received special revelation will be judged by general revelation and the law written in their hearts. You understand what Paul's point is now? So he's saying there are two groups of people in this world. Those who received special revelation, which at the time of Paul was Israel, and those who received general revelation, and both groups have received revelation that there is a God, and both groups have God's moral compass revealed to them, one in a miraculous fashion, the other embedded in their heart. So neither group can say, we didn't know there was a God. And even Andrew Martin's testifying. You see that? He's agreeing. This is why I say he's going to fall in love with Jesus more than ever before. 
And an atheist testifies to moral absolutes. You know why? When an atheist gets angry, God says, what kind of God would order genocide or allow people to be raped? You know what they're doing? They're bearing witness against themselves because they're telling you murdering innocent people and raping helpless victims is bad. See, they're testifying. But here, I'm going to tell Andrew. I'm going to ask Andrew this. Isn't that the argument of the militant atheist, the new atheist? Testifying. But here, I'm going to tell Andrew. I'm going to ask Andrew this. Isn't that the argument of the militant atheist, the new atheist? What kind of God would produce a Bible where he orders the extermination of even infants? Oh, wait, wait, wait. So here's my answer. Uh, Richard Dawkins. So exterminating infants is evil, right? Yes, it's a moral wrong. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes, it's morally wrong. It's repugnant. It's reprehensible. Okay, here's my question. Here's my question. Apart from God, prove to me that moral absolutes exist. Prove to me objectively that exterminating infants is a moral evil. Prove to me objectively, not subjectively, because it feels wrong. Objectively, that raping a helpless victim is evil. Prove it to me. And even Andrew Martin, on what grounds can he say, I'm opposed to abortion in general unless it's harming the woman? Why would harming the woman justify abortion, but in other circumstances, it wouldn't justify it? What is your moral compass? Point to an objective moral compass by which you just made that statement. See? But are you absolutely certain that you don't believe in absolutes, Andrew Martin? You see the circular nature of his argument? Are you absolutely certain? You see my point? You get the point where I'm where I'm going with this. When an atheist, see, harming as an obvious harm. What is so obvious about harm? Can you demonstrate objectively something that's obviously harmful and why if something's obviously harmful it's bad why when a lion harms its prey you don't condemn the lion and put it to death because you know this is the law of the jungle the survival of the fittest so when a lion tears up its prey to eat or attacks <clears throat> another animal weaker than it you don't say damn you lion that's murder. We need to put you to death. If all you are is a more evolved animal, who cares whether one human animal preys on a weaker human animal? <clears throat> so what? You see the point? Yet, yet, you know where I'm going with this. Anyway, I'm not. Let's come back to the issue. What's my point? When the atheist tells you that is wrong, that is reprehensible, that is repulsive, that is evil, thank you for bearing witness to the truth of what Paul said. You just proved that what Paul said is right because you just testified the moral compass has been embedded in your heart. So instinctively, you know this is wrong. And yet you want to deny the God who placed that law in your heart. Do you see the point now? You see how the, the atheist attack on what God's commands in the Bible have led to the extermination of people. They are bearing witness to what Paul said. The law is written in their hearts, and so they know instinctively this is evil. This is wrong. It shouldn't be done. And so God is going to use that against them on the day of judgment. Is that clear? You understand what Paul is arguing? This is where you're going to see the brilliance of Paul the wisdom of Paul, the knowledge of Paul that is truly from the Holy Spirit. He leaves everyone silent without an excuse. Even if it's an instinct, King of Kings, who placed that in instinct within them? The Creator. Okay, but let's come to this point now. Now you understood what he meant. Those who sin again, uh, apart from law will perish apart from law. 
He's not saying they don't have the law. He's saying the law wasn't revealed to them miraculously like it was revealed to the Israelites, but still the law, the moral compass is embedded in their heart. And when they sin against that law in their hearts, God will use that to condemn them. You understand his point? Before I move on to what Paul is trying to say in context, you understand his point? So he's saying Gentiles who did not receive the law like Israel did, they will still be judged. They will still be condemned. Why, Paul? They don't have the law. Yes, they do. The law is in their heart. Their conscience convicting them or acquitting them. So you're saying, Paul, everyone has knowledge that God exists and that this God has revealed a moral code? Yes. Even Gentiles who didn't receive the law like Israel did? Yes. How do you, how do you explain the fact that Gentiles know adultery is bad? Raping someone is bad. Sleeping with animals. Where do you think they got that from? That's his point. Torturing someone is bad. You get the point, right? You understand this? Do you see the brilliance, the wisdom, the knowledge this man was given by the Holy Spirit? Why I'm in awe of Paul and he's my hero? Because of what the Spirit did in and through him for the glory of Christ? So the real question is this. Here's the real question. Now that we've explained what Paul means, what did Paul mean when he said that if a Jew or Gentile earnestly seeks immortality, honor, and glory by good deeds, he will be rewarded with eternal life. And what did he mean in Romans 2.13? That those who do the law, not hear it, will be justified. Is he saying you can be justified by faith and the works of the law or the works of righteousness that God has prescribed by the grace of God? Many people tell you, yes, that's what he means. But here's what I'm going to show you about how to interpret, not just Paul, but the Bible, how not to interpret. Paul is making a case for his gospel. Let me explain what Paul is doing. Paul is making a comprehensive case for the gospel that God gave him to preach, and he's anticipating objections and refuting them. So Paul's argument for the gospel that he's preaching doesn't start in Romans 2. Do you know where it starts? The context of Romans 2 doesn't start in Romans 2. Do you know where it starts? Do you know where? Can someone tell me? This is the problem with chapter divisions. Because you have chapter divisions, you assume that if one chapter ends, then the next chapter starts up a new theme. The earliest Greek manuscripts did not have chapter divisions or versification. So you'd have to determine from your reading where one theme ends and another starts. The context of Romans 2 begins in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And Paul continues the theme of his gospel all the way to Romans 8. Did you know that? So if you want to properly understand Romans 2, you got to start at chapter 1, verse 16, and keep reading till the end of Romans 8, that entire section is this comprehensive explanation, expli explication of the gospel that Jesus sent him to preach. So let's read Romans 2.13. Romans 2.13. King of Kings, he's aware of C.S. Lewis, but keep on topic so we don't distract anyone. Let's read Romans 2.13 one more time to show you Paul does not mean that people can actually be justified by keeping the law or doing good deeds. Romans 2.13, one more time. For not the hearers of the law are justified before God, just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So Paul is saying, if you do the law, you'll be justified. Yes, if you do it. 
But Paul is about to show you the problem is no fallen human creature can do the law. No one has been able to do the law. And no one will ever be able to do the law because we're fallen, we're tainted, and it's inevitable we break the law and therefore die. That's the point he's making. So he's telling you, yes, if you do the law, it's not simply hearing it. You got to do it. And if you do it, you'll be justified. But I'm here to show you no one has been able to do it and no one can do it. Are you ready now for the proof? That's what Paul is saying. Are you ready for the proof? First, let's see how he starts off the section. Romans 1, 16 to 17. Romans 1, 16 to 17. First, let's see how he starts off the section. Watch here. In Jesus' name, may you bless the internet connection. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, please, Lord. Oh, man, I hope I don't start buffering. Okay, Romans 1, 16, 17. Notice how he starts this section. He tells you what the gospel is. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Sound familiar? Now notice 17. For therein is the righteousness of God. In the gospel, this righteous standing <clears throat> before God, the righteous standing, that God gives you so that you can stand before God justified <clears throat> is revealed in that gospel. And this righteous standing that is yours before God. In other words, Paul is saying, if you want to be assured, assured that you have a righteous standing before God, that when you stand before God, God will view you as being righteous and just and not a sinner worthy of his wrath. This gospel reveals how you attain that righteousness from God, that righteous standing from God, and this is how you attain it. Faith. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul quotes Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, to show that this gospel I'm preaching to you is not new. It was already affirmed in the Old Testament, and this righteous standing that we enjoy before God comes by faith. It's been by faith from the beginning and it'll be by faith till the very end. From faith to faith, meaning this righteous standing has been given by God from the beginning of, of the fall when man fell and this righteous standing will still be by faith at the end of the age. From the time of the fall till the end of the age, this righteous standing from God, this righteous standing we enjoy before God is by faith as even the Old Testament confirms. You see what he just did? You see what he just said? He's telling you this gospel, the good news, that I can stand righteous before God, that I can have a righteous standing before God, that when I stand before God in judgment, he'll view me as righteous and not guilty and therefore won't condemn me. That righteous standing, is by faith, and it's been by faith from the very beginning. Abraham attained a righteous standing, standing by faith. David attained a righteous standing by faith. And they all knew it was by faith because they all testified it was by faith. Don't believe me? Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Don't believe me? Genesis 15 verse 6. And he's going to quote it later in Romans 4. Do you get it now? Yep, exactly, Nada. Now, let's go to Romans 2, 17 to 25. Romans 2, 17 to 25. Exactly, Andrew. And faith is not just mental assent. For Paul and the New Testament writers, faith is trust. Trusting in Jesus, cleaving to Jesus, clinging to Jesus. Not mental assent. Many people have mental assent. Yeah, I know Jesus, Son of God, but do nothing to honor him in their lives. Now notice what Paul says to the Jews. Romans 2, 17 to 25. Read. Romans 2, 17 to 25. Read with me. Behold, thou art called a Jew 
you who say you're a Jew and rest this and you rest in the law, you trust in the law, your confidence is the law of Moses and make us thy boast of God, that God, the God of Abraham is your God. Talking to you and know us his will. You know what his will is and approve us the things that are more excellent. You approve the things in the law being instructed out of the law and are confident that thou thyself art a guide. You are confident because you're a Jew. You know the true God. You know his will. You know his law. And that you boast that I'm a guide because I can tell people what God's law is. I can tell you what the true God has revealed to you Gentiles. Right? Your guide of the blind. A light of them which are darkness. Now notice what he says to them. An instructor of the foolish. Those who are foolish when it comes to the ways of God. You teach babes which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Now notice what he says to them. Notice what he says in 20. Notice he's going to condemn them too. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? You teach others. Why don't you teach yourself, you hypocrite? Thou that preachest a man should not steal. Dost thou steal? So you know stealing is wrong and you tell people don't steal, but you yourself steal. Thou that sayest the man should not commit adultery. Dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? You tell people what is right or wrong, but you fail to do it because you're breaking the law daily. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? You boast you know the law, but you fail to keep it. For the name of God is blaspheming among the Gentiles through you as it is written. For circumcision verily <clears throat> profiteth if thou keep the law. See, your circumcision would avail you if you keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. It is of no avail. So you know what Paul just did? He indicted them. So what? You're a physical Jew. So what? You're physically circumcised. So what? You know Abraham. So what? You know the law. So what? You boast that the God of Abraham is your God. You're breaking the law daily. And because of that, you're shaming the name of God in front of the nations. You see what Paul is doing here? You understand what he's doing here, right? He's making a case. Gentiles and Jews are lawbreakers, and both groups deserve hell. He's trying to make a case. For the universal sinfulness of man, that all humans, because they're sinners, have broken the law. No one has been able to do it. So all of them deserve wrath and condemnation. That's what he's trying to do. He's making a case for the gospel. Now let's prove it. Romans 3, verses 9 to 20. Romans 3, verses 9 to 20. When you see the wisdom, knowledge, understanding that the Spirit gave Paul to make his case, you'll see truly this is the Word of God. It is brilliant. Romans 2, I mean Romans 3, verses 9 to 20. Read with me. What then? We Jews, are we better than they, the Gentiles? We physical Jews, are we better than the Gentiles? Because Abraham's our father, God revealed the law to us miraculously, and we're the heirs of the prophets and the covenants. No, in no wise. We're not better than them. We're actually far worse. We're worse off than them. Notice what he's saying. And no, 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 we're not better than them. In fact, we're far worse than them because our judgment will be worse. For we have before proved. See, I have proved. Notice what he's saying. Guys, pay attention. I have demonstrated and proved both Jews and Gentiles that they all are under sin, that they are all under sin. As it is written, now he's going to quote the Old Testament to prove it. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They have fallen from the path. They are together become unprofitable. They're useless. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. They only speak death. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their list. And these are, by the way, these are all citations from the Old Testament, especially from the Psalter, from the Psalms. He's quoting the Old Testament, right? <clears throat> uh, 
Their, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. Have they not known? There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, shut, and the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Wait, 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 wait. Let's compare Romans 3.20 with Romans 2.13 again. Romans 3.20 and Romans 2.13 again. Watch here. So I'm going to make a case for why I believe in sola fide. If you disagree with me, that's fine. Don't debate me. Hear my case. Ask the Spirit to show you if I'm wrong. Save you from error. And go listen to other presentations by Roman Catholics, Orthodox, on their view of justification. But now pay attention. Pay attention. Romans 3.20, back to back with Romans 2.13. Now watch here. 2.13. Here you have a contradiction if you don't know how to interpret Paul correctly in context. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But wait, Paul, you just said in the previous chapter, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Paul, you're confusing me. You just said, no one, no flesh, no Jew, no Gentile will ever be justified by the deeds of the law. But earlier you said, those who do the law will be justified. And Paul is saying, don't be that stupid. Yes, if you can do the law, you'll be justified. But that's my point. No one can do the law. No one is able to keep the law. Everyone breaks the law. So everyone deserves death. That's my point. You see what happens when you take a verse out of context? Now let me emphasize what you're learning. Biblical hermeneutics, the science of interpretation. A passage must be interpreted in, in its context. The context can mean the chapter itself or the chapters before and afterwards or reading that passage in the light of all that that particular author has written on the subject. So Paul has written 13 letters. You need to examine everything that Paul has written about this particular subject in all his letters, assuming that he's consistent and doesn't contradict himself, and take all the verses into consideration and then understand what he means on a particular subject. You with me there? Uh, no, not really, Jeffrey Dahmer. If I want debates, they can set it up, and I'll be more than happy to come, like I did with the black Hebrew Israelites and other groups, and I'll be more than happy to defend what I believe the Bible teaches, but not in a teaching session. I know you're anxious for me to debate for you. Come on, Jeffrey. Gird up your loins and debate yourself. Okay, now... Is Paul saying in context that a person can do the law and be justified? Is that what he's saying in Romans 2.13? Or if you read Romans 2.13 in light of Romans 1.16 and in light of Romans 3, he's teaching the opposite. He's saying, yes, if you do the law, you'll be justified. But I'm here to tell you, no Jew nor Gentile is able to do the law. They all stand condemned and worthy of hell. Now, this is not just Paul's position. Did you know Paul is confirming the words of Jesus Christ and the Old Testament? Let me show you what Jesus says. John 7, verse 7, and John 7, 19. John 7, verse 7, and John 7, verse 19. Watch here. Paul is in perfect agreement with all those that came before him, especially his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know why Protestant quoted Isaiah 64, 6. He's trying to impress us. Even though I said John 7, verse 7 and 19. I love Protestants, but not too much. I'll tear them to shreds too. John 7, verse 7 and 19. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Jesus speaking. 
because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Wait, Jesus said the works of the world are evil. Now notice what he says to the Jews, John 7, 19. Jesus speaking to the Jews. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet not one of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? Wait, Jesus, you sure sound like Paul. Or I should say Paul sounds like you. The, the works of the world are evil. No Jew has been able to keep the law. But the law reveals what sin is. The law tells you what sin is. And guess what, folks? Once you know the law, then you know what sin is. Which means when you do sin, you have no excuse. The law tells me this is good, this is bad. Without the law, I cannot objectively know what is good and bad. But God has placed the moral compass in my heart so that my conscience convicts me. Don't do that. You should be doing this. And Paul says, because everyone has the knowledge of the law, everyone is accountable to the law, and I'm here to tell you the bad news. Everyone has broken the law. You catch it now? Yes, the Holy Spirit convicts you with the law he put in your heart. And when you go against that conviction, you're going against the Holy Spirit. Behold what manner, manner of love. Did you catch Paul's point? Now I'm going to make Protestant happy to show you the Old Testament teaches what Paul is saying. Isaiah 64, verses 6 and 7. Now I'm going to make you happy, Protestant. I didn't want to burst your bubble. Should have to knock you off your horse and now lift you up. Isaiah 64, 6 and 7. Isaiah 64, 6 and 7. Verses 6 and 7. Watch here. But we, Isaiah including himself, but we are all as unclean things. Pay attention. Pay attention. And all our righteousnesses, notice he didn't say our evil deeds, our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. We've been blown away in judgment and wrath because of our sins. And there is none that calleth upon thy name. What? What do you mean no one calls on his name? Meaning no one calls in his name in a manner pleasing to God, because they're all disgusting before God. That stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. Wow, Isaiah sure sounds like Paul, right? Isaiah says, There's none of us that call upon you. Well, hold on, many were calling on him. And Isaiah's point is, No, none of us calling on Jehovah in a manner pleasing to him, because when we call on him, all of us are in a state of sin. An abomination to God, reprehensible to God, so that even when we call on him, it disgusts him. None of us call on, him, call on him in righteousness. But here's what's sickening. He gets very graphic. Notice again Isaiah 64, 6. He does not say our evil deeds are like filthy rags. He goes our righteous deeds, even that which is good, disgusts God because we are disgusting, dead in sin. Slave to sin. Notice the language, Isaiah 64, verse 6 again. So Paul is in perfect agreement with the Bible, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Notice Isaiah 64, verse 6, one more time. Yep, watch Bill Thompson. You know how graphic it is. And pardon my sisters who have to hear this, but I have to just be honest to what the text is. Look at any lexical source when he says all our righteousnesses or righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Filthy rags refer to the menstrual rag, the rag that women used to purify themselves when they were on their period. And when he says an unclean thing, he's describing people as women on their periods. You understand how disgusting this is? He's saying, when you, being dead in sin, tainted by sin, offer righteous deeds to God, it's like giving God 
your menstrual rag, the rag you use to purify yourself of your, of your blood. That's how disgusting you are before God. Yuck. So, is there hope? Is there hope? Is there hope? Paul, you just condemned all of us to hell. Jesus agreed. The deeds of the world are evil, and none of you keep the law. Isaiah agreed. So that means we have failed, and we will fail to justify ourselves by keeping God's law. So we're pretty much going to hell, right? That's it. It's over. He goes, ah, that's what I want you to realize. I wanted to get you to the point, to the realization that you deserve hell. You stand condemned. And there is no hope of attaining a righteous standing before God by keeping the law because now I'm going to give you the good news. Now I'm going to give you the good news. Now that I've got you to the point, notice the brilliance here. Notice the wisdom, the understanding from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit guiding Paul to bring you to the point of despair. That's it. It's over. I'm done with. I deserve hell. God is disgusted with me. There is no hope. And he goes, you see your point? You see your condition? You see your condition, right? You deserve hell, right? Even your righteous deeds are disgusting before God, right? Yeah, that's it. It's over. I can't do it. That's why Jesus did it for you. Romans 3, 21 to 23. Bam. Now the good news. Romans 3, 21 to 23. Romans 3. 21 to 23. Ah, uh, but that's not the end of the story. Because now I'm going to give you the good news. That, by the way, after today, you should be on your knees, more in love with the triune God, more in love with the Father, more in love with Jesus, more in love with the Holy Spirit, and thanking them more for this good news. But, it's not over. But, but, now the righteousness of God. This righteous standing before God. This righteous standing that God confers upon us. Which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Right? But the righteousness of God. Without the law. I now have a righteous standing that I don't earn by the law. Without the law. Pay attention. Without the law. Read it. Is manifest has been revealed. I can have a righteous standing that doesn't come from the law. God has now revealed, manifested to me, that I can be righteous in His sight, but this righteousness doesn't come from the law. And it's been manifested and borne witness to in the law of Moses and the prophets. The Old Testament already told us about this righteous standing, and I'll show you where. This answers the other question that people ask me. How are the Old Testament saints justified? And Paul says, they're justified like we are, by faith in Jesus Christ. They knew it too. And I'll prove to you they knew it. But just wait with me. Bear with me. This righteous standing that comes from God without the law that I don't attain by the law has been now revealed. And the law of Moses and the prophets already bore witness to it, already prophesied about it, already spoke about it. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Did you catch it now? Paul is saying, but wait. Haven't you read the Old Testament carefully? The Old Testament told us that God would confer upon us a righteous standing. That God would justify us. Not by keeping the law, but because of the Messiah and his righteousness. Because of Jesus and his righteousness. And once we trust in Jesus, God gives us his righteous standing. Let me just give you one of the most obvious, obvious places in the Old Testament where the Old Testament already announced beforehand. Beforehand. Israel, you and the nations will be declared righteous, will be justified. Because of the Messiah, who is God in the flesh, your Savior. He will come to justify you. 
The most obvious prophecy, Isaiah 53, 10 to 12. Pay attention to verse 11. Isaiah 53, verses 10 to 12, but pay attention to verse 11. Watch here. So Paul wasn't lying. Paul wasn't making it up. It was always there in the Old Testament, but Paul was blinded to it until the Holy Spirit opened his eyes. Yet it pleased Jehovah, Yehovah, to bruise him. He had put him to grief. And when thou, you, the Messiah, the servant, shall make, when you, God, Jehovah, will make the soul of the Messiah, your servant, an offering for sin, Hebrew, Asham, when you take the soul of your servant, the Messiah, and offer it up as an Asham, a guilt offering, he then shall see his seed, he shall <clears throat> prolong his days, and the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. Now pay attention to verse 11. Pay attention to verse 11. Watch here. He, the servant, the Messiah, shall see the travail of his soul. Meaning, he shall see the fruit of his suffering. The result of his suffering. Offering his soul as a sacrifice, he will see the result of it. What will that result in? And once he sees the fruit of his suffering, the Messiah will be satisfied. He'll be happy and content. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Bam, there you go. The knowledge of my righteous servant will justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he, he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Do you get any clearer than that? By his knowledge, he will justify many. Bearing their sins, making intercession for them. <laughs> Over 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the Spirit revealed to Isaiah, that servant to come, he will justify you and the world by bearing your sins and offering his soul as a guilt offering. And that's how you'll be justified. Wow. And the phrase, by his knowledge, can mean one of two things. And we know this is a prophecy before Jesus was born because we found the Isaiah scroll in the Dead Seas, a nearly complete copy of Isaiah that's identical to a copy of Isaiah that was produced a thousand years after Jesus, showing the miraculous preservation of God's word and the Isaiah scroll that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 is dated about 125 years before the birth of Jesus. And you go to Google and put Dead Sea Scrolls Isaiah and you'll see a copy of it. You with me there? Now, what does the phrase by his knowledge mean? By his knowledge means, can mean our knowledge of him. Knowing him intimately. By his knowledge, meaning by us knowing him intimately, trusting in him, he will justify many. But it can also mean by his personal suffering, his personal firsthand knowledge of suffering. By his personal suffering, he justifies us, or it can mean both. Is this sinking in? Is it sinking in? Before I move on? Do you see how amazing and mind-blowing the wisdom, knowledge, understanding of Paul is in this letter? And it's because the Holy Spirit gave him that wisdom, that knowledge, understanding. And do you see the miraculous consistency between the New Testament and the Old Testament? Leaving us with no excuse for walking away from this beautiful, miraculous revelation from the true God, the Holy Bible. If you understood this thus far, let me unpack something beautiful in the King James Bible, which is, again, the King James Bible did an excellent job of translating the Greek. Others translate what they think the Greek means. 
Uh oh, here comes Hater Wood. Hater Wood is proof of total depravity and that you're only saved by grace alone. Because if someone like him can be saved, you know it's grace. Because he makes the strongest case for the corruption and depravity of the human condition. So thank you, David Wood. You too are miraculous proof that we are saved by grace alone. Thank you, brother, for your existence. You give us hope. But anyway, Romans 3.21. <laughs> Romans 3.21. Let me let's compare Romans 3:21 with the King James and then the NIV. Daryl Nutt, if you keep praying for my health and more importantly to be holy and pure in love with Jesus by my deeds and pray for my daughters that will be brought together in provision and the Lord keeps me around, I don't have to, you know, have this wicked judge after me. I'll keep teaching you these things as the Holy Spirit teaches me because he gives me this knowledge to share with the body, meaning sharing with brothers and sisters like you for the glory of Christ. He didn't give me this gift for myself. He gave it to me to, for me to use it to build the church. And it's my honor to serve you if you have an open heart and want to hear and not debate and challenge me and try to prove me wrong. Okay, let's compare Romans 3.21 and the King James with the NIV. And here's where the King James is beautiful and much better than the NIV in this regard. Okay. I'm sorry, Romans 3.22. Romans 3.22. Romans 3.22. Romans 3. And see, this is a blessing to hear Andrew Martin, who though he claims to be an atheist, he's passionately, madly loving with Jesus Christ, and he's going to worship Jesus sooner than later and be a great tool in the hands of Jesus. For this man to say this, really, you know, this man loves Jesus. Notice what he said. Christians. If you're new here, Sam is like one of the best Bible teachers. For him to say that, a man who's been around, that's a blessing. And you know this man loves Jesus. And he will be worshiping Jesus sooner than later. Just be patient. The Lord is patient. He knows his heart. Romans 3.22, King James, NIV. Guys, read. Compare. Here's where the King James did a better job than in NIV. Pay attention. King James, Romans 3.22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now compare the NIV, Romans 3.22. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Now let's put them back to back again. And guys, pay attention. It's subtle if you don't pay attention. And they have a note in brackets telling you that the Greek can mean something else. Okay, let's look at it again. You want meat? I'm giving you meat. Look at it again. Watch here. Romans 3.22, King James, NIV, back to back. Guys, hold back on the counts because you got to see this. Please see this. And here's the key. Please see this. Wait. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, of. Compare the NIV. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. Now they have... Those brackets knowing footnote. Is Paul saying it's our faith in Jesus Christ that justifies us? Or is he saying it's Jesus' faithfulness in carrying out the will of God that justifies us? You don't need to guess because the context shows you. The King James got it right. It's not saying it's my faith in Jesus Christ that justifies me. It's saying it's Jesus' faithfulness. That justifies me when I believe in him. The reason why I know it's the faith of Jesus Christ, not faith in Jesus Christ, because it goes on to say to all who believe. If Paul was saying it's my faith in Jesus Christ, then he's repeating himself superfluously. It's a tautology. The fa it's faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Well, Paul, you already said it. Why are you repeating it? In other words, if you go with the NIV, Paul is saying justification is given to those who believe in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Paul, you just said that. Why are you saying it again? Why are you repeating? You just said believe in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Does that make sense? Actually, it makes better sense if he's saying this justification is given 
because of Jesus' faithfulness to those who believe. You see? But when the NIV tells you faith through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ, they're telling you what they think the Greek means. But then they give you a note. Did you see the brackets, FN? Because if you read the note, they say, or the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. So the King James captured it much better than the NIV. What Paul is actually saying is this righteous standing from God is given because of Jesus' faithfulness to the will of God, faithfully carrying out the will of God to those who believe in him. In other words, it's Jesus' perfect faithfulness and obedience to God's will that merited justification which is now given to anyone who believes in Jesus Christ. And do me a favor, Protestant, post the footnote to Romans 3.22 in the NIV, because they tell you that the Greek can also be rendered this way. Because I'm going to tell you what the good news is in a minute. Yeah, I just know I was drinking Powerade. Man, okay. Okay, Romans 3.22. Did you see Protestant believer put their footnote? Notice they go, or through the faithfulness of. So they're admitting to you that the Greek construction can mean Jesus' faithfulness is what brings about justification. Do you see it? In the main text, they told you what they think it means through faith in Jesus Christ, but then they give you a note, or Paul could be saying, through faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus' faithfulness. And actually, what Paul is saying is, it is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Jesus is faithfully carrying out God's will that merited justification for us who believe in him. And I'll prove to you that the Greek is, Jesus' faith, the faith that Jesus had, meaning his faithfulness in carrying out God's will. Let me prove it to you. Let's compare Romans 3.22 with Romans 4.16. Romans 3.22 with Romans 4.16. Sometimes my computer shuts down. May the Lord enable me to recall these passages perfectly. Yeah, we're on here. King James again. Thank you, Susan Baker. You captured it. You put your faith in the one who faithfully carried out God's will on your behalf. Notice the construction. Okay. Sorry, guys. Hold on. Okay. Here. No, compare Romans 3.22 with Romans 4.16. Compare. Faith of Jesus Christ. Now, notice in Romans 4.16 it says, the faith of Abraham. No one denies that the phrase faith of Abraham means Abraham's own faith and trust in God, right? You see in Romans 4.16, same construction. Faith of Abraham. No one denies that means Abraham's own faith and trust in God. So then why in Romans 3.22 would you translate the construction faith of Jesus Christ as faith in Jesus Christ? You catch it? Would anyone say that in Romans 4.16, Paul is talking about faith in Abraham or he's talking about Abraham's faith in God as a model for us to have faith in God? So, better translation of Romans 3.22 is this righteous standing of God is ours because of Jesus' faithfulness in carrying out God's will. It is his faith, his faithfulness to the will of God that earned this righteous standing to, to those who believe in him. And to show you it's Jesus' faithfulness in carrying out the will of God, 
His obedience to the will of God that justifies you to prove that? Go to Romans 5, 18 to 19. Romans 5, 18 to 19 to prove it. I'm going to have to do a part two tomorrow. I'm going to do a part two tomorrow, God willing, to show you that even the Old Testament saints were justified the same way we are. Okay? Okay. Romans 5, 18, 19. Here's the proof that Paul is saying it's Jesus' own faithfulness, his own obedience in carrying God's will that makes you righteous. Here's the proof if you don't believe me. Romans 5, 18, 19. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Okay? Adam's one offense brought condemnation to all of us. Even so, by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. There you go. Jesus' righteousness, the righteousness of one, resulted in the free gift of justification of life for us who believe. Now, 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. What else do you want? What else do you want? Do you want further proof that Paul is saying it's Jesus' faithfulness, his perfect obedience to God's will, his perfect righteousness, living perfect seven days a week, 24 hours a day, every second of his human existence till he died. That resulted in our justification. You catch it? Is it making sense or not? Gets better. It's going to get better. Go to, again, King James captures it perfectly. Even the CB, Common English Bible, captures it perfectly. Yeah, Romans 3.31 says that now you fulfill the law. How do you fulfill the law, Riaz? By now understanding the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was to drive you to Christ. The law was meant to show you that you are a lawbreaker and a sinner and you need a savior. Once you come to Christ, you now fulfill the law. Because you understand what the purpose of the law is. You get it now, Riaz? You see what he's saying there? We who now believe in Christ fulfill the law because now we recognize the purpose of the law. The law was never given to save us. The law was given to show us we deserve hell and we need a savior. And once we re recognize, man, I need Jesus, we now fulfill the law. And God says, you get it. You get it. You finally get why the law was given. To show you your wicked, corrupt, sinful condition and your desperate need of Jesus Christ. And that's in Romans 10, verses 1 to 4. Romans 10, verses 1 to 4. Specifically, verse 4. Let's look at it before we go to Philippians. Romans 10, verses 1 to 4. You tell me the Bible is not supernatural, divine, mind-blowing. And this Paul was truly a slave of Jesus filled with the Spirit. Do you see the brilliance of Paul, the insights by the Holy Spirit? Romans 10, verses 1 to 4. Romans 10, verses 1 to 4. Pay attention to 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. They're zealous for God, but not according to knowledge. They don't know the true knowledge of God. Why? Pay attention, guys. You got to pay attention to this. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. They're ignorant of how to attain this righteousness from God. And going about to establish their own righteousness. They're trying to make themselves right by, by obeying the law. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They have not accepted God's righteous standard and how to attain that righteous standard. And notice verse 4. Notice verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law. For righteousness to everyone that believeth. The word end 
telos in Greek means the goal of the law. Christ is the goal of the law. The law was given to point you to Christ. He is the goal of the law. The law is telling you, go to him. And when you come to him, you now realize what the goal, the purpose, the aim of the law was. So the Jews who reject Jesus have not fulfilled the law because they do not know the purpose of the law. In their ignorance and arrogance, they think the law can save them. Paul says, I was like them too, a Pharisee who thought the same way. Now, by the grace of God's spirit, I know better. The law was never meant to save me. The goal of the law was to show what a wicked sinner I am. I deserve wrath and I need a savior. And the savior I need is Jesus. And when I trusted Jesus, I now fulfilled the law and realized that was the purpose of the law, the goal of the law to bring me to Christ. You tell me this is not a beautiful gospel? You tell me this is not a gospel from God and the Bible is not the word of God and the God of the Bible is not the true God? Tell me not, it's not mind-blowing? So, Ria, you understand what Romans 3.31 is telling you? Now that you've come to Christ, now that you've trusted in Christ, you fulfilled what the law was given for. And you tell me, Paul was not one of the most amazing human vessels of Jesus Christ. And why he's my hero, and I pray I can be like Paul for the glory of Jesus. Who was absolutely nothing apart from Jesus. Now, Philippians 3 8 to 9. We'll start at 7. Philippians 3, 7 to 9. Pay attention again. Almost done. I'm going to have to do a part 2 tomorrow. God willing. If, I'm, if I have time tomorrow. I don't know. We'll see. Philippians 3, 7 to 9. King James again captures it perfectly. Now, Philippians 3. Why are you putting Galatians 3, 16, brother? But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Whatever I gained by the law, from a worldly human perspective, I count it as a loss. I don't care about it. It's rubbish. Notice what he says. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Do you remember Isaiah 53, 11? By his knowledge, that's what Paul is saying. I will give up everything. I will lose everything just to attain the knowledge of Christ, to know Christ. That's Isaiah 53, 11. He's echoing Isaiah 53, 11. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. And Paul says, by the knowledge of Christ. You see, it's the language of Isaiah 53, 11, right? You see, he's echoing Isaiah 53, 11. By the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. I'll come back to the word dung in a minute. It's just as graphic, Isaiah 64, 6. Now notice verse 9. The key is verse 9. I don't know why you gave me 10. I think you want to give me a brownie point, Protestant believer. And be found in him, found in union with Jesus, in relationship with Jesus, in communion with Jesus, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, not trying to attain a righteous standing by keeping the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. I will be found in Jesus, united to Jesus, in fellowship with Jesus, in communion with Jesus, trusting in Jesus. And once I trust in him and united to him, then God gives me a righteous standing because of Jesus' faithfulness and my trust in him. Now watch this. Don't take my word for it. Google Philippians 3.9, Daniel Wallace, and the Greek word for dung. It's skubalon. Skubalon. 
That was the graphic way, and I'm going to say, because you're grown-ups here, that was the graphic way of saying shit. The Bible writers did not hesitate and were not ashamed of using graphic language, contrary to wishy-washy, westernized, effeminate Christians. It's not Christ-like, brother. You're too harsh. You're using harsh language. Well, read Ezekiel 23, verses 20 to 23. Read Isaiah 64, verse 6, which we just read. Read Malachi chapter 2, verse 3, and tell me whether the Bible writers, the prophets and apostles filled with the Spirit, thought that way. You know what Malachi 2, verse 3 says? God speaking through Malachi, he says, I'm going to take the shit of these defective animals, and I'm going to smear that shit on your faces. I'm going to smear the shit on your faces. Did you know that? That's Malachi 2, 3. Here, Paul literally says, I count them as shit. Everything I had, my obedience to the law, my fame, the respect of my peers, my status, it was all shit to me. That's what he literally says. Do you know that? That's what he literally says. But don't miss the point. I'm not lying, guys. I'm not making it up. You know what he's trying to say? It's the knowledge of Christ, fulfilling Isaiah 53, 11. Knowing him, trusting in him, being united to him by the spirit, loving him, hoping in him, cleaving to him, that God gives me this righteous standing because Jesus earned it for me by his faithfulness. Final passage, so I can sum up and move you by the spirit's power to show you how beautiful Jesus is. Hebrews 5, verses 8 to 9. And then I'm going to give you an illustration. Hebrews 5, verses 8 to 9. Right? Watch here. This is what we call the great exchange, and this is why I believe in sola fide, because I believe the Bible teaches this. I know others don't. That's fine. You can disagree with me, but this is why I believe it. Now, Hebrews 5, 8 to 9. Let me unpack this. Hebrews 5, verses 8 to 9. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Notice, he learned how to obey God through suffering. In other words, he learned what it's like to remain faithful in spite of suffering and persecution and even being killed for it. That's something he learned when he became man. That now, obeying God will cost me my life. Obeying God will result in people hating me, rejecting me, spitting in my face, beating me, plucking my beard, whipping me to, to the point of death, right? Beating me to a bloody pulp and nailing me to a cross. That's what it's going to cost me to obey God. So now Jesus as a man learned the cost of obeying God through suffering. But then notice something interesting. Jesus who is God in nature and perfect by nature Notice what 9 says, and being made perfect, made perfect, being made complete, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now notice, if you obey him and trust in him, he's the author of your salvation. He's the one who brought salvation because he obeyed to the point that he became perfect. Well, what does that mean? Let me explain. This is where you're going to get blown away. Do you remember what Romans 2.13 says? The one who does the law will be justified. But Paul means doing it perfectly, not trying. So you know what Jesus did? All right. Since God demands doing the law to his satisfaction, doing the law perfectly, and no one can, I'm going to become a human being. I'm going to live the perfect human life in perfect obedience to the law so that through my perfect human obedience, I will earn justification. So when it says made perfect, the imagery is a human babe born morally innocent, maintaining that moral innocence perfectly till he dies, and finally attaining perfect human moral obedience or moral perfection. You understand what he's saying here? Jesus went from being morally innocent to attaining moral perfection through his perfect human obedience to God's will, living the perfect human life. 
But Jesus is life. He is eternal life. He doesn't need to earn justification. Why did he do it? For you. In other words, he says, I will stand in their place. I will live the perfect human life that they're supposed to but can't. And through my perfect human obedience, I will attain human moral perfection. And when I attain human moral perfection, through that moral perfection, I will earn justification, glory, honor, and immortality. Not for me, because I am life. I am immortality, but for you. And if you believe in me, it's yours. So here's what happened. Our sins condemned Jesus to die. So he paid the penalty of sin. His perfect life is what gets us into heaven. So here's what we call the great exchange. Here's two records of two lives. Okay. Pay attention to this. In my right hand is Jesus' record of his human life on earth. You open it, perfect, sinless, flawless, every thought perfect, every inclination perfect, every desire perfect, every word perfect, every action perfect, from conception to the grave. Here's my record. Evil, wicked thoughts, inclinations, desires, words, deeds, lust, hate, envy. This record brings death. This record brings life. You know what Jesus did? He said, take my record, put your name on it, and present it to my Father. And so Jesus gives you his record, and you present it to the Father. And then when the Father sees your name, he opens the book. Wow. Perfect. Flawless. Sinless. Enter heaven. And then Jesus says, give me your record. Then he takes your record, wipes your name, and puts his name. And he presents it to the Father. Worthy to die, condemned to death. So this is what we call the great exchange. Jesus says, give me your sins, and I'll give you my righteousness. To heaven you go, to the cross I go, to save you from death. No wonder they call him the Savior. <laughs> no wonder they call him the Savior. You cannot love him enough. You cannot thank him enough. You cannot live in a manner that will bring him glory enough. You have to, I have to do more. So this is what Jesus said. Son, daughter, come here. Give me your record. Here's mine. Take it to my father. This will bring you to heaven. This will bring me to the cross. And I do it gladly because I love you. I'm in love with you. And I want you to be with me forever. No wonder they call him the Savior. As one man said, I'm a great sinner, but Jesus is a great Savior. You will never be able to love him. Now you see why Paul says, everything I have, the fame, the status, I consider it. And I will say it the way he said it. I consider it absolutely shit because it's nothing in comparison to what my Savior did for me. Jesus is our love, our life, our joy, our happiness, our peace, our wholeness, our creator, our maker, our potter, fashioner, savior, redeemer, sustainer, provider. He is our all in all. He is everything. So on your behalf, I will say, we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
We can never thank you enough and love you enough. So help us to thank you more and love you more. Die to ourselves and live for you. And please have mercy on us when we fail. And please, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, keep all of us in love with you and bring our loved ones, my daughters, to be in love with you. And Abba, if you're pleased, save me from this judge to continue to do this for your glory. You don't need me. I need you. We love you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Modern author. Lord willing, I'll do part two tomorrow, God willing, to show you how the Old Testament saints were saved, that they already knew of this salvation in the Old Testament by the grace of Jesus. Pray for my miracle, November 20th, that God keeps me out of this wicked judge's <clears throat> snares. Christ is risen, risen indeed.